Hi everybody. Well today we are going to be starting a new series called Reconciled. And the text that we're going to be using over the next number of weeks is going to be Romans chapter 5 verses 1 to 11. A beautiful passage of scripture which talks about the wonder of the gospel. It mentions the word reconcile or reconciliation about three times in the passage and it's an ideal text to look at to talk about a topic like reconciliation and being reconciled. But what I want to do today is to basically just introduce the series and kind of set the scene of uh, in relation to what is to follow. Well, in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, right at the beginning of our Bibles, we have that tragic chapter which speaks about the fall of humanity. Adam and Eve sin, and as a result, sin enters into the world. And from the outside, we might look at that and think, that tr transgression seems quite small, yet the impact of their actions and of that sin entering into the world was devastating for creation. Just like a little bit of yeast impacts the whole loaf of bread, so sin has impacted all of creation. And all of our lives are in some way tainted by the brokenness that sin brings. And um, one of the first consequences that we see of sin is that Adam and Eve hide from God. And what God intended to be a beautiful and intimate relationship between himself and humanity suddenly becomes characterized by fear, suspicion and doubt and ultimately to outright hostility towards God. One of the things I find quite interesting in this passage is that it is Adam and Eve who hide from God. You know, it is God who seeks them out, but it is they who are hiding from him. And what we see there in some way is a continue, is, a, is something which is continually reflected in the relationship between God and humanity. He is the one who seeks us out for a restored relationship, and humanity is trying to hide from him. Now the brokenness that we see in the relationship between God and humanity very quickly replicates itself, itself in human relationships. So in Genesis chapter 3 verse 16 there's a verse which says God speaking to Eve says you will want to control your husband but he will dominate you. Now that is quite a tricky passage of scripture with a number of people having different interpretations but I don't think anyone would deny that what we have in essence there is a sense that the relationship between husbands and wives, between men and women, and somehow is not like God intended. In some way, it's been impacted negatively as a result of sin, as a result of the broken relationship between God and humanity. And then very quickly, almost shockingly so, in Genesis chapter 4, we see Cain killing Abel, a brother killing a brother. And um, it is a story which has captivated writers uh, throughout the ages. Most probably uh, the most famous example of this is John Steinbeck in his book um, East of Eden, where he describes the broken relationship between brothers as a result of a broken relationship with the father. And then by Genesis chapter 6, God is saying that the earth was ruined in the sight of God and the earth was filled with violence. This brokenness in relationship has quickly resulted in a catalog of evil and, and hatred and violence, which, which flows through all the pages of the Old Testament. We see, that, for example, uh, father against son and son against father, like Absalom and David. We see husbands against wives. We see friends turning against friends. This catalog of broken relationships. But God those beautiful words when they occur in the Bible. What we see is that God so loves us, even in our brokenness. He so loves us that he, he desires to make a way to save us from ourselves. So Jesus, the Son of God, enters into the world preaching repentance, a change of mind, a change of perspective, to, to see things differently, because the kingdom of God has come. A kingdom whose anthem is crazy, unstoppable love. Talk about a mind shift. And this Jesus, he, he, he preaches about loving your enemies. I mean, talk about uh, something being completely opposite to the idea of, of human friction and argument.
But he doesn't only preach about it. He demonstrates it as he goes to the cross and he loves those. Those who are nailing him, hammering in nails into his, into his hands and to his feet. Who are whipping him and who are mocking him. He loves them. And when the Apostle Paul describes this, what Jesus has done, this, this good news or the gospel as we know it, one of the things he emphasizes is that Jesus, God himself, the perfect picture of God's intention for humanity, for that is what Jesus is, has made possible through the power of the Holy Spirit a new humanity which is made in his own image, the church. And a church was to be a place where dividing walls of hostility were to be removed between Jew and Gentile. And Jew and Gentile would love each other in a way which would be a, a, a declare the manifold wisdom to principalities and powers and authorities who trade in hatred and jealousy and envy and violence and anger. This picture of the church as, as something which, uh, which demonstrates the kingdom through healed relationships, through um, um, love for one another, something which stands so contrary to what the world has fallen into. And you can read about this in the book of Ephesians, where it's a great example of, of how Paul speaks about this. And as you walk through the pages of the New Testament, you, you see examples of where Christians have grasped the gospel. It, it's, it, the penny has dropped, and we see the impact that it has on the relationships around them. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, Peter preaches in Jerusalem and 3,000 people believe, filled with the Holy Spirit. And such is the impact of the gospel on these people's lives that they begin to love each other practically in self-sacrificial ways so that none of them are in want or in need. We see examples of this, I believe, in the church of Galatia, in Galatia, prior to to it becoming corrupted by false teaching. When the gospel first arrives and, and Paul preaches and they accept it, we get this uh, impression, this picture of the church being filled with joy, peace, and with, with loving one another. And then I think we see it again in the church in, in, in Philippi, uh, where they give sacrificially to Christians that they don't even know. But why do they do that? Because they, they do know Jesus and they are in awe of the gospel. And that causes them to love in a counter-culture way. But we also see in the New Testament, and one of the things I love about the New Testament is it doesn't, it doesn't hide the, the scars and the ugliness and the mistakes of the church. We see division in the church in Corinth. We see judgmentalism entering into the church in Galatia. We even see that... Um, there, are, there is uh, um, arguments between the widows in the early church in the book of Acts. Now, this is a warning and a reminder to us that the gospel is not a one-off moment of realization and acceptance. Like, I understand the gospel, I've accepted it, and uh, that box is ticked. But rather, a lifetime where we fight every day through the Holy Spirit, for it to become a greater truth to us than our own selfish inclinations. It is a day-by-day -day, uh, fight, if you like, to let it seep into our consciousness and the gospel to control our actions, our thoughts, our behavior, and our emotions. Unfortunately, uh, church history also has these two um, Examples. We see examples in, the, in, in church uh, throughout the ages of incredible sacrificial love, places of reconciliation and redemption. And yet we also see places of the church being divided and actually being a catalyst for division. And although this is be these, these kind of two examples follow us through, throughout history, if you like, um, for me, the last four years have been particularly stark in this regard, whether it is regarding the Trump administration, Brexit, Black Lives Matter, this COVID crisis, but all of these things seem to have come in quite a short period of time, have, have not only caused division um, in our cities and in our broader communities, but the impact of that division has also been found in our churches 
as well. The devil does not have his own raw materials, but he takes the crisis moments in our lives and he uses them effectively to sow division, fear and suspicion. So what do we do in this space? How do we respond to this? Because when I, when I look at the church in some respects, I, I, I see it not acting, not behaving in the way it was called to, to demonstrate the manifold wisdom of God to principalities, powers and authorities. Well, right from the beginning of this message today, I was saying that it all starts where the relationship between humanity and God was broken. And that brokenness began to replicate itself in our human relationships. So for me, the place to start is for us to immerse ourselves in the gospel, to put ourselves in a place where we let it seep into our minds, into our actions, our behavior, into our thoughts, into our conversations, into our social media posts, and into our consciousness. And that is why over the next number of weeks, we're going to be looking at this passage, which so glorifies the gospel, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. But before I give a quick overview on that, there's just two comments I want to make, maybe in the form of kind of caveats in a way. Human relationships are complex and multi-layered. And I am not naive enough to think that one can give a simple one, two, three quick solution to something as complex and multi-layered as that. And that call me having a lack of faith or maybe being a little bit cynical, but we are going to continue to have estrangement, divorces, broken relationships, hurts between friends until Jesus returns. Because we are broken people that by God's grace and through the power of the Spirit, we are being made whole and increasingly into the image of Jesus. But that is a journey and broken people hurt one another. We damage each other. And so I do believe that we are I'm not trying to talk over this series about eradicating um, this um, completely. But what I do believe is when we really grasp the gospel, when we as a church begin to grasp this, and in so doing, open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit, because it's when we, when we put our trust in Jesus and, and, and grasp the wonder of the gospel that we open the door to the Holy Spirit in our lives, that when we begin to do this, we will see a great deal more reconciliation, redemption, and healing in our relationships than we currently do. I believe it is the, it is the, 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 the gospel will, 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 will change the narrative in our churches. The second thing to mention is that there are also perspectives and positions that we as the church should absolutely reject because they are wrong and because they are dangerous. And sometimes the rejection of opinions or of perspectives can result in a break of relationships. And we see actually evidence of this in the New Testament itself. Among the New Testament writers, they, they give us examples of this. But here again, if we have the gospel seeping into our minds and our consciousness, into our thinking and into our decisions, then even in these rare and difficult moments where this might have to happen, we can do it in a way which demonstrates Jesus and also create opportunity for restoration and reconciliation. All right. Now, I just want to give us a little brief overview of um, like, a, like a bit of an introduction to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. In the build-up to this particular passage, Paul goes into great detail to show how everyone has sinned, how everyone has fallen short of the glory of God, of God's intention for humanity, and that in some way we are all estranged from God, all have a broken relationship with Him. And as Paul is describing this in Romans, he's using the contrast between Jew and Gentile. But he equally could be saying between Democrat and Republican. Both Democrat and Republican fall short of the glory of God. Gay and straight. Those who um, are, believe and agree with Black Lives Matter and those who don't. Those who are social justice uh, warriors and those who are um, climate change deniers. Everyone, all of those people have fallen short of the glory of God. 
all of them. Your allies, those who agree with you, your enemies, those who, you, whose opinions you, you vehemently disagree with, as well as yourself. And that is one of the things that Paul is trying to do in these early chapters. He's trying to say that you Jews, you must not think you're better than the Gentiles because you're all in the same boat. He says in this passage, he says, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one righteous, not even one. And then there is this, this, this part of this verse in, in chapter 3, verse 19, where it says, why is he describing this? So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Those are sobering words. Those are, those are powerful words. You see, the starting point of it all, the starting point of reconciliation, is getting an understanding of our shared place of guilt before the judge of all the world. In this passage that we're going to look at in Romans 5, 1 to 11, the way Paul describes us um, as we stand before God as ungodly and as sinners and even as enemies of God. But we are also told that because of God's persistent, indescribable love for us, his persistent, indescribable love for you, for your allies and those who agree with you, and for your enemies and those who you vehemently disagree with, his, his indescribable, persistent love for all humanity drives him to to, to make a way to reconcile us all to him, to restore that relationship between humanity and himself. And the starting point of all of this is that it is God's desire to reconcile. It is God's desire to restore the relationship with us. The Bible is quite clear that it is not us looking for restoration with God, but it is him who is desiring restoration with us. And the key to this restored relationship is Jesus. He is this gift to the world that gives us all access to the very lap of God, to confidence in the presence of Yahweh, to, 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 the, 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 to be able to call God himself, the creator of heaven, her, heaven and earth, Abba, Father, to peace with God. For all who have put their faith and trust in Jesus have peace with with God. So my prayer for us over the next number of weeks as we, we go through the series about reconciliation is that the gospel itself will seep increasingly into your mind, into your consciousness, into your words, your conversations and into your actions that we might see a restoration of relationships and healing in places that we, we maybe thought we would never see healing. And that equally, we as a community would resist the attempts of the enemy, our enemy, the devil, to come and bring division or discord at a time where division and discord seems to be all over our, our society. My desire is for us as a church, for the church, to be that beacon of restoration, reconciliation that declares the manifold wisdom of God to the world. The Lord bless you.